Dear guests, yeah. welcome to our presentation, China and Eurasia Rethinking Cooperation and Contradictions in the Era of Changing World Order Book. Facilitates exchanges between researchers from around the world on China Eurasia relations, campaign perspectives and methodologies. In, it promotes interdisciplinary dialogue on China's pivot towards Eurasia, the Belt and Road Initiative, Beijing cooperation and arguments with India, the EU, the Western Balkans, and the South Caucasus states, and the Sino Russian struggle for multipolarity and multilateralism in Eurasia. It is also researchers' digitalization processes in Eurasia, focuses notably on China's digital sphere road and digital agenda of the Eurasian Economic Union. Scholars from different nations, including China, India, Russia, Austria, Armenia, Georgia, United Arab Emirates, and Montenegro introduced their own independent research, making recommendations on the developments in relations and demonstrating that for joint discussions, uh, it is possible to find uh, ways for cooperation and for ensuring peaceful coexistence. At first and foremost, I want to thank co-editor of this book, Professor Heinz Gartner, who, who did a lot for these contributions. Thanks are due to all its authors who worked so hard to achieve this result. Thanks go to Dr. Emilian Kowalski, and the Rutledge team for their important suggestions and support. Special thanks go to Dr. David Arase and uh, Dr. Andre Kortunov for reviewing this book. We are also grateful to the partners of China and Russia Council for political and strategic research, Yerevan State University, Institute of Oriental Studies, Asia Global Institute, and International Institute for Peace for their support. Thanks go to Professor Ruben Safrasian, Dr. Robert Hazaran, and Dr. Arthur Israelian, Mr. Joe Honio for providing space facilities for our discussions. Before giving the floor to our speakers, I need to ask you to switch off all my microphones. At first, we will have all reports, and after the panel discussions, we will have question and answer session. You can raise your hand, and we will provide you an opportunity to give you your question, please at that time introduce yourself. You can also write your question in chat and after moderators will read them for the speaker whom you will, whom you will measure. So we will start in. And at first I want to give a floor to our keynote speak speaker, Professor David Arase. Dr. David Arase is honorary professor at Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong um, and a resident professor of international politics at the Hopkins Nanjing Center of the Johns Hopkins University. His three, uh, his three most recent books are a Rutledge Handbook on Africa-Asia Relations, China's Rise and East Asia Order, and the US-Japan Alliance, Balancing Soft and Hard Power in East Asia which was awarded, uh, uh, awarded the O'Hara Memorial Foundation Special Prize. Uh, dear Professor Arce, thank you very much that you have found time for us. The floor is yours, please. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, uh, dear fellow speakers, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, I would first like to thank uh, Dr. Meir Sakin, founder and director of the China Eurasia Council for Political and Strategic Research for inviting me to this auspicious event. It's a great honor and a privilege to speak before you to mark the publication of the book, which we're celebrating today, China and Eurasia, Rethinking Cooperation and Contradictions in the Era of Changing World Order, published by Rutledge and edited by our own uh, Dr. Professor Sahakian and Professor Heinz Gartner. Now, this book assembles distinguished scholars from across Eurasia to assess each from their own particular perspectives, an historic effort to integrate the Eurasian continent into one vast market for trade and development. What we see today for the first time in the modern era is the desire for a collective cooperative effort 
amongst Eurasian nations to bring Europe and Asia into a close economic embrace that would bring prosperity to the vast middle regions of Eurasia that have suffered from being so distant from the maritime arteries of global commerce. No one in Eurasia would oppose this idea in principle. And in fact, all the major Eurasian actors joined by their smaller neighbors are enthusiastically in favor of more trade, prosperity, and peaceful development. This shared desire is what brought the diverse expert chapter contributors together in this newly published volume. They are to be commended for promoting this idea of an integrated Eurasian economic space through peaceful, cooperative, collaborative effort. And they very properly focus on the role of infrastructure investment and management as the first practical need and essential foundation for realizing this great undertaking. In this volume, you will find key drivers, issues, and problems that help to explain this bold undertaking. Russia's Eurasian Economic Union Initiative, China's Belt and Road Initiative have been key drivers. In particular, China has spared no expense or effort to realize its Chinese dream of Eurasian integration, which focuses on the construction of new Silk Roads that will bring together a community of shared destiny for all humankind to share China's growing prosperity. But China's push across Central Asia into the Northern, Western and Southern regions of Eurasia bring forth a host of issues and problems that need to be resolved. And this is happening in an era of rising regional rivalries after America's post-Cold War unipolar moment has passed. You'll find all this dealt with in this book with great insight and fine detail. And I reckon, it to, I reckon this book to be a major contribution to our understanding of Eurasia today. Now, having said that, let me just mention a few uh, recent trends and developments uh, that will certainly affect the nature and future course of the Eurasian integration process. First of all, and I'm sure this is very much uh, uh, on the minds of all of you, is, is the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and what this means for Eurasian integration. Uh, certainly it's going, it's going to pose a challenge. Uh, the US of course spent the last 20 years trying to construct a stable, peaceful, democratic and prosperous Afghanistan. And in fact, the US itself proposed a new Silk Road initiative to connect Central Asia through Afghanistan uh, to the Indian Ocean region in order to bring prosperity to this region. But after 20 years, the US just gave up and, and left rather, unfortunately, uh, in, not in the best way. So this is going to uh, present a, a big challenge uh, for this whole project of Eurasian integration. And it's going to call for more cooperation. Uh, Next, you know, we see deepening strategic partnership between China and Russia. And uh, this is actually a, a good thing for Eurasian integration. Uh, but one of the questions is whether they can, they can cooperate enough in the economic realm in the, in the areas of Eurasia that they both face. And this uh, this is going to be uh, this is this this is going to be a, an issue to be dealt with uh, going forward as well. Next, there's Iran's membership, new membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In a sense, uh, this could be viewed as a very positive thing because Iran's diplomatic isolation is being relieved. It's now uh, 
uh, a member in a multilateral regional organization devoted to stabilizing uh, the heart of Eurasia and bring prosperity to it. But Iran's membership will also bring with it, again, new challenges. And uh, so this, uh, this too will, will, will be an, a new challenge going forward uh, in this great project. Next, there's Turkey's new ambition to reassert a regional, the identity of a regional power, you know, with new, with new uh, access to Central Asia uh, through the Caucasus and across the Caspian right into Central Asia. Uh, and of course, with the rising Turkish identity, national identity playing an important role in its politics, uh, Turkey too will want to play a, a greater role in this effort. And so a role for Turkey uh, will, have to be, will have to be found. And then finally, the deterioration of Sino-Indian relations, a relatively recent phenomenon since the summer of last year, uh, but it seems to be a decisive turn in this bilateral relationship. And of course, India, uh, would play a very great role in this whole Eurasian integration project. project. And so the implications for Eurasian integration here would, uh, would also be complicated. And this puts Russia actually in a rather difficult position because it sells weapons to both parties, right? So, so this is this is not this is this is also going to be a bit of a problem for for Eurasian integration going forward. So what what I'm trying to say here is that the centrifugal forces of geostrategic rivalry threaten to hinder the integration effort, which has been motivated by the attraction of trade and investment cooperation. But one needs strategic trust and cooperation in order to build firm trade ties, to build trade rules, to forge common governance institutions. And so more work of the sort that we see in this book is needed to understand and manage this challenge. And so I, I would commend everyone to, to pick up this book, read it, and then I would also I would also urge the, the authors in this volume to, to continue uh, on this path uh, going forward. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to talk to you today. Dear Professor Arase, thank you very much for your very important speech. And dear friends, it is my honor to provide the floor to Dr. Bin Ma. Dr. Bin Ma is an associate Professor at the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies, Institute of International Studies, Fudan University. Dear Bin Ma, please, the floor is yours. Uh, could you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, it's my great honor to share my uh, views with uh, all of you. Uh, in my in this book's chapter, I think it's chap uh, it's chapter four, and uh, my 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 chapter is about the problems and the prospects of the transportation uh, infrastructure connectivity between China and Russia. Uh, as we know, the infrastructure connectivity between China and Russia is a uh, uh, very important part of the BRI uh, in the past uh, many years since the BRI was put forward, and. Uh, uh, the most uh, important progress of uh, the BRI, uh, I think, is in this uh, field. And uh, uh, my my report will be uh, my report contains uh, have three uh, three contents. The first is the role of transportation infrastructure connectivity between the two regions in the BRI. As I said, is uh, very important. I will detail it later. And the second is the, the second part is the achievements of this uh, connectivity between China and the Eurasian countries, and uh, as uh, as um, as um, I mentioned in the in this chapter, I use a case study of the China Railway Express 
is the typical project of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and uh, was uh, uh, mentioned a lot in the Chinese media and academia and uh, also the, uh, the, the other countries, uh, academia and uh, uh, public medias. And uh, the third part is the obstacles of transportation uh, is infrastructure and connectivity between China and the Eurasian countries and also uh, use the China Railway Express as a case for uh, to trans to explain this kind of obstacles and uh, the final part is about the possible way of uh, uh, future development of uh, uh, these two regions uh, connectivity and uh, the first uh, uh, the first part is about the role of the transportation infrastructure connectivity. Usually, we think the uh, the this kind of connectivity is the five one of the five priorities of uh, BI uh, BI uh, BI uh, Bamboo Road Initiative, and because we can see we can saw that in the 2013's uh, vision and action of uh, BI. But uh, uh, in 2015, in October of 2015, the Chinese government held a conference about uh, this, uh, about the BI uh, building issues and uh, it's uh, put the uh, facilities on the top priorities. Of, uh, it's the top priority of all the others. And uh, uh, this uh, make uh, the, a transportation infrastructure connectivity um, more uh, more objective in all the other projects and uh, about the uh, about the case about the China Rail Express we can see they have a very rapid growth in the past ten years and uh, especially after two thousand thirteen and uh, we can see there's a uh, explosive increase of the trends between China and uh, uh, Eurasia countries and uh, Europe countries. Uh, at the beginning in 2011, it's only 17 trends, but uh, in 2020, I mean last year, it's uh, 12, it's 12, it's 12,000, it's more than 12,000. So uh, the numbers will be one, it, it, uh, it's almost, uh, Almost one thousand. It's almost eight. It's almost seven. Seven seven hundred times about uh, uh, seven some seven hundred times about this increase, and it's very impressive. And that's the reason why a lot of media, a lot of uh, uh, scholars, they pay a lot of attention on this project and. Uh, there are a lot of studies about this kind of increase and uh, they explore the, this kind of the reasons why this, uh, uh, this transportation, this connectivity can be so, uh, so impressive and so, it can be growth so fast. And uh, uh, some discussions also mentioned the obstacles of the future development and uh, the obstacles, what happened in the past several years. Uh, usually they, especially in the past two years, we can, we know uh, the, the, uh, the sea transportation was, uh, was uh, blocked and also the, the, the airline and also the other kind of transportations was blocked or affected by the pandemic. But uh, we can see the increase uh, the rapid increase in the past year of the uh, China Railway Express is uh, almost a uh, uh, 50% increase uh, in the last year about the trends about the trends between China and Europe between China and Eurasia. So there are a lot of uh, discussions and uh, um, because uh, there's so impressive growth. So there are some, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, active uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of ideas think this will be uh, this will be uh, more and more important in the uh, between China and Europe between China and Eurasia corporations especially for the free train free transportation but uh, uh, as uh, I as my study has mentioned in this uh, uh, 
uh, about this uh, transportation, I, uh, I explored several obstacles, uh, mainly uh, uh, obstacles of this uh, transportation about this uh, connectivity. And it's also a case of this connectivity. I divided these uh, obstacles into three sorts. The first is the, uh, the, the, the gap or the, uh, the different uh, uh, opinions or the uh, purposes between the government and the enterprises. Uh, when we look at the governments, especially the local governments and the uh, companies who involved in this kind of transportation, you can find their uh, their purposes uh, early. Uh, they, they have some similar purposes. They have some, uh, some similar goals, but uh, at the same time, they still a lot of uh, different uh, purposes. So this kind of uh, difference will make their efforts in this uh, connectivity, in this uh, uh, cooperation. They have uh, different efforts. Sometimes it will uh, make some obstacles for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, connectivity. The second uh, part is the transit and the terminal. As we know, uh, some countries in this uh, in this region, like Russia and uh, Mongolia and uh, Kazakhstan and uh, uh, Belarus and uh, uh, also and uh, nowadays is uh, uh, Ukraine and they they those countries. Uh, they are the transit countries, but uh, at the same time, they are also the terminal countries. But uh, these two rules make they have different uh, thinking and different uh, goals about uh, this uh, uh, connectivity. So uh, for some country, the transit is uh, um, is their is their uh, is their main role and. Uh, they hope to because, uh, as we know, they uh, this kind of connectivity have different rules. One, uh, for example, uh, most of the trains from China to uh, uh, to Eurasian countries, uh, I mean Russia or the other Eurasian countries, are through Kazakhstan, almost uh, uh, seventy percent. But uh, uh, at the same time, Russia want to play a more important role in this kind of transportation. So their policies toward this kind of transportation, they is to encourage the companies, I mean, the companies who involved in this kind of uh, transportation, and they, uh, in, they want to encourage those companies to use the Russian route, not uh, through Kazakhstan. So they have the uh, discounts, they have uh, subsidies, something like that. So this kind, this kind of obstacles will make, uh, uh, will uh, will make the, uh, will make some obstacles for the, the whole connectivity. Uh, and the third thought is about the bilateral and the multilateral. Uh, and until now, those kind of connectivities, uh, uh, is mainly through the bilateral, uh, is mainly through the bilateral way to solve some. Problems to solve to do, to hold the obstacles, but uh, uh, this kind of transportation, as we mentioned, is uh, it covered a uh, lot of countries. So the bilateral cooperation, the bilateral way, sometimes um, did not hold all the things, all the obstacles. So this is the three obstacles I mentioned in this uh, article, and uh, I also want to share uh, this to all of you. For the future development about this uh, transportation, I hope to. Uh, I have uh, uh, also have four uh, four points. The first is the joint cooperation based on the domestic development policy. This part is mainly uh, focused on the first sort of obstacles about uh, the differences uh, um, between the government and the enterprises, because uh, there is a lot of. Uh, Rules. There are a lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, trends, um, a lot of lines between this kind of connectivity, and there are some competition among them. So, for the future development or for this uh, uh, in the, for this section development, uh, the joint cooperation based on the domestic development policy should be uh, uh, should be uh, put should should be. Uh, emphasized uh, not only for the 
local government, but also for the enterprises who are involved in this uh, uh, transportation, also the connectivity. The second part is about improving uh, the qualities and efficiency of the ongoing of the ongoing projects. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, you can if you have uh, 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 noticed uh, some uh, some reports about this connectivity, especially the China Railway Express. They uh, maybe you have uh, uh, you have noticed that they have a lot of critics of uh, uh, of the of the transportation. Some people said the the empty the empty containers the empty uh, all, and the low efficiency of the return trains. So uh, the second part about the future development, uh, I think is uh, very necessary is uh, improve the efficiency of this kind of uh, uh, transportation, especially for this part, I focus on, um, focus on the, uh, the local network uh, cooperation. That means uh, the different lines among China and uh, among the terminal countries, they can cooperation, they can cooperate, they can coordinate each other for this kind of um, uh, transportation, not only compete with each other. Uh, the third, uh, the third part is uh, the third way is the expanding cooperation with third parties, uh, because uh, until now, the main discussion is about the. Uh, it's about the cooperation between China and uh, Eurasia countries and also the Europe countries. Uh, the start point is uh, China, but uh, uh, for the future development, the, the third party, the third party countries should be involved in this one, like Japan, like Korea, like some the other uh, uh, Pacific, uh, uh, Pacific countries can involve in this uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. the, the fourth one is uh, the last one is developing the high, uh, high edge value transportation because uh, uh, in the past several years this uh, kind of transportation have uh, did not uh, very strict rules to select the goods. I think in the future they have to add the value, uh, the high value uh, goods for transportation. Not only not like now. Okay, that's uh, that's my. Uh, that's my sharing for all of you. Thank you very much. You know, Dr. Ma, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very interesting contribution. And uh, dear friends, let me introduce our next speaker. It is my honor to introduce you, Dr. Vahtang Charaya from Georgia. He is the head of Tbilisi State University Center of Analysis and Forecasting, also affiliated professor at Business and Technology University. Here's uh, Professor Chara, the, pro the floor is yours. Thank you, dear um, Per, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to thank everyone for being uh, here today and for uh, sharing with us our uh, achievement of publishing this wonderful book. Uh, and uh, let me say a few words about the strategic cooperation between China and the South Caucasus uh, in particular. Uh, there are two authors, me and uh, Maria Mlashki, but um, I will present our part uh, today. Uh, so uh, let's begin. So uh, in this chapter, I will not speak about uh, the whole chapter itself uh, to give you all the essence what we have inside, but I will give you more kind of hints uh, that um, will uh, will uh, push you to read the book itself. Uh, so uh, the first uh, part, which you will see in our chapter is um, related to China's global aspirations. It's uh, politics, economics, international projects. Uh, it is participating strategic dominance. Uh, it tries to uh, achieve in the region uh, and globally uh, open and hidden wars, um, which are uh, in general in uh, from the economic um, uh, platform. And uh, for instance, everyone knows that uh, US and China has uh, open trade wars. There is a kind of hidden war between Euro European Union and China. Uh, the same goes more or less for the investments as well. China 
is very strict in this direction, uh, as well as European Union tries to be very strict in terms of foreign direct investment. So there are a lot of different aspects which uh, will be interesting for the reader to find uh, in this book. And uh, you will see that uh, from our perspective, we see that China is the growing power. Uh, it's one of the most influential powers uh, in the world, but still uh, it has some lack of uh, at certain aspects uh, to be number one, so to say. Um, now, uh, a few words about the South Caucasus. Uh, so these are countries which are at the same time very similar, but very different. Uh, if you are a foreigner and visit all these three countries, probably you say that uh, uh, they are really um, very close to each other from different perspectives, but uh, at the same time, uh, there is, a, let's say, different political orientation for all three countries. Uh, there is a um, different religion for all three countries, uh, and there is a lot of different aspects. And uh, unfortunately for us, for the whole region, uh, there are um, conflict uh, issues which are unsolved so far. Uh, Georgia has its own conflicts, Armenia and Azerbaijan has uh, their own conflicts. So uh, despite the fact we would appreciate me, let's say personally, I would appreciate that uh, the peace would be uh, and stability uh, would be the best option for this region. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it was impossible so far to achieve this peace and stability in the region. And uh, most probably for the next years, it will be um, the same story again. But I hope uh, once and forever, this uh, situation will be solved somehow. And uh, uh, that will give us an extra advantage uh, in terms of uh, attracting investments, uh, being, uh, um, being a good place for uh, doing business from international uh, business communities. So uh, here you see several numbers of our countries, um, uh, how it's easy uh, to do the business uh, from different aspects uh, in our region. Of course, doing business doesn't mean only uh, time uh, that you need to open your business or the percent of uh, the uh, taxes, uh, how uh, high or how low it is. But uh, uh, if you take the whole picture and combine the all different aspects which um, uh, is... Uh, um, presented in this region, will it be uh, cheap labor force, uh, low taxes, will it be good business infrastructure um, uh, for different businesses, or will it be um, different rankings, international rankings where um, uh, Caucasian countries are taking uh, um, top uh, positions. Uh, you see that uh, a lot of different business opportunities uh, uh, are provided in this country. So. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I also would like to underline that, uh, let's say, if uh, Georgia, Georgia's main aspiration is to be a part of European Union, um, Armenia is already uh, a member of the Eurasian Union, which uh, uh, somehow conflicts go, goes into conflict uh, with the European Union in terms of uh, different regulations, different um, uh, different regulations in general. And uh, the Azerbaijan uh, is neither part of uh, European, Eurasian Union and even don't tries to be a part of European Union. It tries to make an alliance with the Turkey in the region and to be, so to say, a separate power in the region. So uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting moments uh, within these countries which uh, would be interesting for the reader to discover. Okay, so uh, the cooperation itself, uh, if we take Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, you can see that uh, all these three countries have different level of cooperation with China. If you take in terms of investments, Azerbaijan is uh, dominating. If you take in terms of tourism, let's say, uh, Armenia is dominant. If you take in terms of trade, Georgia is uh, the uh, top country in this case. Uh, but in general, uh, China has advantage, so to say, against all these countries. Uh, it will be trade, investment, tourism, or etc. Um, uh, China is the dominant player on the market. Uh, and in general, uh, if you calculate the trade balance, of course, uh, if you take even the whole South Caucasus and uh, 
China as one. Uh, you see that uh, South Caucasus region is uh, um, has trade deficit with China. Uh, China is investing more in this region than uh, South Caucasian countries could afford uh, to invest in China and um, other issues. So. Um, it's uh, really interesting uh, how these three small countries could manage uh, such a, a different um, cooperation level with China uh, and uh, how it could come that in this small region, uh, how all the, these countries uh, are cooperating with China uh, through different channels, let's say, uh, in terms of Azerbaijan, mainly it's um, oil and gas uh, resources, uh, which uh, China uh, China is interested in uh, Azerbaijani uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, let's say in terms of Georgia, the uh, cooperation is very diversified, I would say, uh, but still small in uh, the total scale. Uh, as um, Chinese companies are presented here from, uh, let's say, tea growing uh, industry and finishing with airline companies. And uh, in between, there is a tourism industry, agriculture, and um, different um, uh, different issues as well as construction, let's say. In Armenia, it's also um, uh, Chinese uh, investors are uh, interested in different uh, aspects. And uh, uh, that's all is quite interesting uh, to discover. So Belt and Road Initiative is um, an initiative which China offered to the world and uh, where Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan tries to find their own way. You know all that officially um, uh, there is no post Caucasian country on the Belt and Road Initiative. It goes uh, either above, if you look on the map, above South Caucasus or below South Caucasus through Russia or through Iran, Turkey and other countries. So. Uh, uh, we have uh, written here several uh, alternatives for the Belt and Road Initiative where mm -hmm. South Caucasian countries could be also part of this Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, by the way, it's not obligatory, so to say, to be on the official map uh, as such of uh, Belt and Road, but uh, for this region, it's important to be part of the global trade and global uh, business activity which will promote Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia through different aspects. Uh, and um, here uh, we see that uh, there is a potential in the South Caucasus to become from a transit hub uh, to an economic hub uh, through, let's say, uh, free trade agreements, which uh, we have in the region uh, through uh, different uh, schemes and with different countries and regions. Uh, South Caucasian countries are covering almost, uh, not almost, but uh, at least half of the world with uh, their free trade agreements, let's say Georgia with the European Union and China, uh, and uh, some EU member states as well, uh, excuse me, not EU, but uh, um, some other European countries which are not EU members. Uh, um, Armenia, uh, through its uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union, uh, also has uh, attached uh, quite a big market, and uh, Azerbaijan as well has uh, quite good cooperation with, let's say, Turkey and some uh, other countries. So, uh, if you use all the power of these uh, three countries, uh, you can see that uh, theoretically and uh, in ideal situation, this could be a great economic hub, not only regional hub, but I mean the global hub, which would uh, um, benefit uh, global players as well, which could be um, uh, the Russia, uh, China, European Union, or other big players. So uh, there is no um, reason to, uh, to follow or to um, or, or to try to maintain conflicts in this region, as uh, I believe some countries in our neighborhood are seeing uh, us that if uh, there will be a conflict, uh, permanent conflict, conflict that will uh, benefit some other countries. Uh, but I believe if there will be peace and stability, that will benefit all, all the neighbors, uh, uh, including Russia, including China, including United States, European Union, and all the other players. So. In general, that's what I wanted to say. You, I hope I managed it in my seven minutes, or maybe not. But uh, thank you very much. Dear Dr. Chara, thank you very much for your very interesting speech, and thank you for your peaceful message, which we 
of course, need in South Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And dear friends, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to introduce you Mr. Ebrahim Hashem. He is strategist, consultant, and scholar located in the United Arab Emirates. He is also Asia Global Fellow at Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. Dear Mr. Hashem, please, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Mayor, for inviting me to this uh, very insightful uh, discussion, and it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, and congratulations on publishing the book. Uh, and I'm very happy to have contributed a, a chapter to this uh, very insightful uh, book. So my chapter is chapter uh, 10. It's on the relationships between the GCC countries and uh, China. Well, uh, this relationship on the surface looks like, you know, it's a new relationship. The GCC countries recognized China recently and the trade started actually just going up uh, only recently over the last 20 years. But the countries themselves, um, they see their, their relationship in a longer uh, perspective. They go, they, whenever they talk about their relationship, they talk about more than thousand, more than 2000 years um, uh, of really peaceful, mutually friendly um, uh, relations going back to the Silk Road. And, um, um, and both sides in their communications, whenever they communicate, they actually emphasize uh, this point. So they emphasize the point that this relationship is evolving and it's, it's really uh, progressing very exponentially and it's not really coming out of a, a vacuum. Uh, for example, um, Xi Jinping, uh, the president of uh, China, when he visited um, Saudi Arabia, he published an article in a local newspaper, and he highlighted this point. So in that <clears throat> newspaper, um, he is, he, he's, he's basically saying over 2,000 uh, years ago, numerous camel caravans from the two sides traveled along the ancient Silk Road, and diplomatic envoys from the Seljuk Empire visited China during the Tang Dynasty. Zhang He, the famous uh, uh, Muslim um, Chinese uh, navigator uh, from the Ming Dynasty, traveled to Jeddah to really perform uh, the uh, 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 Al-Hajj, which is the uh, Muslim uh, pilgrimage. Um, so this is from the Chinese side. They always emphasize it. And then also the, the GCC Arab uh, countries, the leaders of uh, the Arab countries in the GCC area, they emphasize this point also. They always say, it's a relation based on a really a long history of uh, friendly, uh, uh, friendly interactions between uh, two sides. Now, this is the really, you know, one part of, one major part of the context of this relationship, but then there's, uh, there's more to it than history. And that is basically related to the one plus two plus three cooperation framework. So this is the framework really highlighted, published initially by the Chinese side in their Arab policy paper in 2016. So what they mean by one is basically energy. So energy is the core of that relationship. And then two is related to infrastructure and trade investment between the two sides. So these are the two wings of this relationship. And three represents three technological breakthroughs in sectors such as space, renewable energy, and nuclear energy. So in this presentation, I'm not gonna go deep into the details of you know, what they mean. You can actually grab the book and go through the chapter, providing you with more uh, details on uh, these uh, elements, the three uh, parts of the cooperation uh, framework. So when you look at this framework and then you just go down and look at the major agreements being signed by the two sides, by the Chinese side and by the GCC country side, you see it's actually being implemented. 
really at lower levels across various sectors, various industries. So just going back to the point of the first one, so the core energy, I want to really highlight why energy is the core of this relationship. If, as you see in this chart, I'm showing you that China actually became a net importer of oil in 1993. And then the gap between energy production and energy consumption has been ever widening. And for China to continue growing economically, it had to basically secure the source of energy, in this case, the source of oil. And at the same time, also, if you look at their um, um, five-year plans, you see that this point actually emphasized. We have to really arrest the energy consumption. And at the same time, also, we have to uh, enhance our production. And at the same time, if we cannot really enhance our production or arrest the, the, the gap between the two, the consumption and the production, we have to secure the source of energy. And as a result, actually, the Chinese have been really successful at uh, reducing the energy intensity of the economy. So what I mean by the energy intensity is basically the amount of uh, GDP unit or the GDP unit uh, uh, produced, uh, how much energy you need to produce that unit. And so, so, so this, this relationship is really complementary. Here you have China requiring energy to continue growing economically. And then you have the GCC countries. Here I'm showing you the pie chart uh, highlighting the oil reserves of OPEC countries, which is really around 80% of the world's oil reserves, proven reserves. And from the OPEC countries, you, you have the major, the leader of the organization, which is Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, representing around 22% of OPEC's uh, oil reserves. Then you have Kuwait, then you have UAE. And then if you add Oman to it, that will represent a, more than a third of the world's oil reserves. So you see the synergy and the complementary, the complementary uh, uh, between the two uh, 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 sides. And that's why energy is the core of this relationship. Now, this relationship is being driven actually from the top by the leaders of the two sides. Um, in the first picture, you see here the Zaid um, order a word given to President Xi Jinping by the leaders of UAE. And the, on the other picture, you see professorship, uh, honorary professorship uh, given by the Tsinghua University to our crown prince. So the two sides leaders, the leaders of the two sides really believe in this relationship and the future of this relationship. That's why our leaders, for example, our crown prince, says what we are doing now is basically laying the ground work. We building the pillars for the next hundred years. This is his uh, quote. This is, these are his words, uh, word uh, by word. So really the leaders of the two sides are really emphasizing this. And also uh, Wang Yi and uh, the Chinese leaders, uh, Wang Yi, for example, said, this region is going to be uh, the logistical hub of um, one side of the Bolton Road. So really emphasizing the, the role of this region and, and, and the Bolton Road uh, initiative. Now, this, this relationship is not really without challenges. There are a lot of challenges. Uh, well, I do wanna say a lot of challenges, but there are really some challenges related to what's going on now in the world. Everybody now knows that the great power rivalry between China and the United States is really intensifying. It started in East Asia, now we are actually starting to feel uh, this intensity of great power rivalry. Uh, and, um, uh, and now how these countries, you know, the GCC countries and China will manage their relationship together. And then how China and United States will manage their relationship uh, together will have huge implications for uh, this region. And then at the really sub-global level, at the regional level, you have rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And here, China um, is trying to manage the relationship between you know, one side, Iran, and the other side, the Arab, GCC Arab uh, countries. And I have to say, China has been, a, has been doing a good job 
managing um, both sides, managing you know the relationships on both sides. And as a result, if you just look at the numbers, the trade numbers, and also the agreements, the strategic agreements, you will see um, uh, they are actually growing for both sides, China and Saudi Arabia and, and GCC countries in general on the one hand, and then China and Iran on the other hand. And also when China signed the agreement to, to just uh, um, uh, upgrade their relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, it did it in uh, 2016, and in the same year, it did it uh, with Iran. So comprehensive strategic uh, partnership with both uh, sides at the same uh, time. So this is in a nutshell, you know, what my charter is about. This is really high level. It's a nutshell, and I am very happy um, uh, uh, to be with you today. And thank you very much uh, for listening. Dear everyone, thank you very much for your interesting speech. And I uh, want to pass moderation to Dr. Mabin from Fudan University. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the next uh, part I will be, uh, I will be helped uh, uh, help us to make our presentation. And the next speaker, and we all know, we all know that is uh, our books, uh, one of my, our books, main organizer and editor, and uh, Dr. Meher, and uh, he is, uh, is also a lot of uh, organizations and conferences uh, uh, founder. And uh, his uh, presentation is about the Sino Russian tendency in Russia and uh, the challenging world order, and which is our books mainly focused on and the world order and the regional order. Okay, please, uh, please. Thank you very much. Can you see my uh, slideshow? Uh, yes. Yes. We see your files, but not these slides. Yeah, yeah, your files, a lot of files, pictures and uh, files. Okay, I will try again. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, dear friends. Nowadays, there are two known Western active integration uh, initiative, initiatives coexisting in Yeo Russia, which could compete and clash with each other over or find ways for conjunction, complementary cooperation, and development. One is the Russian lead, the Russian Economic Union, and the other one is China's Belt and Road Initiative. At the present time, the Northern military powerhouse, Russia, and the world's young economic superpower, China, prefer complementary cooperation and development of their two initiatives over competition. As the US practices against China and Russia, the theory of offensive realists, with which it is trying to strengthen its own capabilities and weaken China and Russia sufficiently so that there will be no changes in hegemonic status and no challenge to the US. In some, Washington's economic and political pressure on Moscow and Beijing is pushing relationships of these two powers closer. They are, avoid, they are avoiding conflicts and focusing on cooperation for their resistance against Washington's heavy pressure and on changing unipolar world order to multipolar. In total, the conjunction of the Russian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative changed the balance of powers in Russia. What kind of influence will this process have on new geopolitical developments in Russia itself? Actually, the US is, uh, still has significant tactical and over advantages over Russia and China, China taken individually. But when taken together, the situation is changed. Sino-Russian non-declared alignment is changing the balance of powers in, in, uh, at least in the Russian continent taking into the consideration the fact that Moscow and Beijing are uniting their efforts against the political and economic hegemony of Washington. China and Russia need, need each other, as Beijing wants, uh, wants Russian energy sources and weapons, and Moscow needs China's vast market for developing its oil and gas production and military industry. China and Russia see each other as strategic partners which jointly struggle against Western dominance and for creating multipolar world order. On May 2000, 
18th in Kazakhstan, the agreement on trade and economic cooperation between the Eurasian Economic Union and China was signed. The following question arises when considering these consequences. Which kind of economic and political opportunities the formation agreement will provide to China and the Russian Economic Union? What were the main aims for uh, signing it? In the Russian Economic Union China agreement, the parties agreed on the importance of economic integration in Asia Pacific and Eurasia, and the importance of the conjunction of the Russian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative as means of establishing strong and stable trade relations. This agreement can set good basis for the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative as an integration initiative and for parties not to clash with each other, but to instead find ways of cooperation and mutual benefit. The conjunction of the Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative provides opportunities for strengthening economic cooperation between the Russian Economic Union and China. It is worth mentioning that this agreement has also political component. It was very important for Russia with China, which is rising its influence in post-Soviet space, accepts the unity of the Russian Economic Union member states and recognize the institution at an official level. In turn, China receives, uh, received benefits as the Russian Economic Union officially recognized the Belen Board Initiative. Beijing also received approval from Moscow to directly invest in Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia without clashing or receiving interference from Russia. This agreement provides an opportunity to Russian Economic Union members to defend their interest during negotiations with big China more productively. Additionally, they can first include the projects in the agenda of the Russian Economic Union in which they are interested and already from strengthened position introduce and negotiate their projects to the Chinese side. I will change the slide. Can you see map? The Russian Economic Union and China closely cooperate on modernization of transportation and communication and the Russian Economic Union China agreement provides added impetus to, for strengthening this cooperation. It is worth mentioning that China plays the roads which are going to Europe for Silk Road economic belts, new Eurasian land bridge, China Central Asia West, uh, West Asia economic corridor, and China Mongolia Russia economic corridor. These extensive transportation links are part of China's efforts to connect its own expanding domestic transport infrastructure, particularly its railroads, with those of its trading partners all the way to Europe and the Middle East. The key main roads uh, connecting China with Europe pass through the territory of the Russian Economic Union. The creation of the Russian Economic Union and the joint decision taken by Russia and China to bridge the Russian Economic Union with the Belt and Road Initiative also contributes to the development of Silk Road economic belts, land roads. Chinese trains and trucks are being served quick, quite quickly at customs control points of the Russian Economic Union countries. For instance, whilst passing the initial, initial customs check in the first member state of the Russian Economic Union, they easily pass territory of our member states without additional stops and financial costs. And let's throw our uh, for conclusion. Uh, in conclusion, the conjunction of the Russian Economic Union and Belt and Road, Road Initiative provides an opportunity for Russia and China to strengthen cooperation in multilateral level, levels and to avoid collision. The Sino-Russian cooperation is productive for our member states of the Russian Economic Union as well. These states will not be in an uncomfortable position and need to choose between a competing or warring Russia and China. The conjunction of the Russian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative gives the, these countries the opportunity to strengthen their cooperation with both Moscow and Beijing. In this process, Shanghai Cooperation Organization plays a role of important platform where Russia and China with other members, mainly Central Asian states, mitigate their contradictions for cooperation. 
Actually, further harmonization of the Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative by the help of Shanghai Cooperation Organization can stand the fundament of creation of the Greater Eurasian Partnership. We have noted that China and Russia jointly trying to change the contemporary world order because now China and Russia together have enough capabilities for actively promoting their national interest and for resisting pressure of the US. Having said this, it is worth mentioning that the US is not satisfied with the current situation as well. The following uh, question arises. Why is Washington not happy with current world order where it has great advantages? Because China adopted and successfully uses and successfully uses the main uh, tools of modern world order, globalization and free trade. As a result, China became the second largest economy in the world and in the near future, it will likely uh, be the largest. I think that it is the threat that the US President Trump has tariffs for Chinese good, goods and escalated trade conflict or so-called trade war with China. Administration of President Biden continues this policy and initiated so-called AUKUS, alignment even without taking into consideration interest of the European ally France. In short, the US also feels that in current world order, uh, vivarizing China, it is difficult to contain Beijing. So the US is trying to change the rules of the game so that China loses its way to superiority. Actually, the US is not the Russian power, but it is still very strong in the continent with its vast network of allies in Eurasia. The US will try to create obstacles for implementation of Eurasian Greater Partnership with its new Silk Road strategy, where Turkey will play a key role. By the help of Ankara, Washington will try to oust from Central Asia and South Caucasus, Russia, and China. The first fragment of this development was Karabakh 44 Days War, when Turkey helped Azerbaijan, and as a result, its military units re returned to South Caucasus uh, after 100 years. Turkey's road towards Central Asia is now open, where it is trying to share its influence by the, by the help of linguistic, cultural, national similarities. Central Asia is crucial for the harmonization of the Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative. For this reason, the US withdrew its troops from Afghanistan, letting uh, modern weapons for uh, 85 billion USD to Taliban. As a result, Silk Road Economic Belts, China, Central Asia, Western Asia Economic Corridor, and the Eurasian Economic Union members in the region appeared under the risk for solving Taliban problem. China, Russia, and the other Shanghai Cooperation Organization members should try to use abilities of other member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Pakistan, which traditionally has great influence on Taliban movement. China should also use its binding strategy for neutralizing Taliban for promising possible investments and financial help to their leaders, if country be stable. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meha. And uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Anahat uh, Pazui, and uh, he is our uh, digital expert, and uh, he is focused on the cybersecurity and uh, uh, and e-governments uh, subject like that. And uh, his presentation, his presentation will about will be uh, will about the China's digital digital Silk Road and uh, Eurasia Economic Union's digital agenda. Uh, please. Uh, Professor Mabin, thank you very much for introduction. Dear guests, uh, I welcome you on this platform, which is a nice chance to introduce our uh, book, which was the result, which is the result of a very interesting conference held back in Yerevan. And we are really looking forward for having more chapters to come that will definitely express our ideas on different fields. Uh, now I will pre present my uh, presentation on uh, digital, um, uh, digital Silk Road. And I would like to share my uh, ideas regarding uh, China's Digital Silk Road and Eurasian Economic Union's Digital Agenda. 
whether they are corporations or still exist some competitions. Well, um, the issue is quite complicated since the topic is very much um, under discussion. And uh, I would like to fix only the main topics that are really uh, worth to consider while discovering or while discussing this issue. So starting from 2013, when President Xi Jinping declared that the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, China's fast movement to the outside market and the collaboration links has progressed rapidly. In the condition of the open market world order, China succeeded to benefit and had become an active player in the international trade. In comparison to trade policy implemented by the Belt and Road Initiative, that was mostly the implication of foreign policy of China, the digital component of it, the digital Silk Road, is the nexus of foreign and inner policy of China, since the regulations, objectives, and task set are addressed for both directions. Despite the fact that Digital Silk Road was first announced as only a part of Belt and Road Initiative, it became an important issue for discussion both on political and theoretical levels, since the advance of technology and the control over data gained by technology may bring to shape another world order where liberal and autocratic systems will struggle for remote control of both global trade and political order. China unpacked its Internet Plus concept in 2015, which shaped the roadmap of China to become a technological manufacturer by 2025 from mainly a consumer. But more importantly, the digital move has drastically changed the position of China in cyberspace, since the strategy's goals to set very successfully implemented and boosted another jump, roll out China Standards 2035 strategy that will aim to not only manufacture, but also become the standards implementer. This will absolutely change the cyber war order where the US enjoyed historical advance and set standards for the world from the position of technological hegemon. The more Chinese companies succeeded in developing and spreading next generation technologies, the more technological politics started to relate to the world order. China, on an international level, is pushing the concept of cyber sovereignty, which is position a state as the main role player in cyberspace. Chinese technologies, projects uh, like safe and smart cities, as well as 5G networks banned in the US and restricted in European countries will find or will need to find new markets for expansion, mostly with ideologically close perception in cyberspace that will ease cooperation, putting them new standards together. Such cooperation is possible on Eurasian continent. Um, the peculiarities of uh, digital Silk Road is uh, within this contribution, we start, we try to group them because there it is not clearly defined. Within this respect, we decided to group them within main uh, topics that were mostly discussed. First of all, it is the digital infra infrastructure. Um, the main um, peculiarity of this digital in infrastructure is that uh, Digital Silk Road Initiative of China is boosting its telecommunication companies to implement large scale digital infrastructure installations offering next generation networks, 5G technologies, carrier services, data centers, etc. China, which with its DCR, is stepping forward to implement uh, carrier services, data centers, and uh, implement its um, investment also in budgeting. And for digital Silk Road infrastructure uh, procedures, it imp inputted 79 billions to become the leader in setting international technology standards and governance norms bodies. Huawei and ZTE are the leading companies implementing investments in undersea and terrestrial telecommunication cables. Among the most demanded projects are the 5G technology networks for both underdeveloped and developing countries. In addition to cellular networks and fiber optic cables, Chinese technology companies are investing also in data centers and a separate component of digital steel growth, which bring a capability for developing and underdeveloped countries to have infrastructure, but at the same time, who are not so much keen on data collection procedures and are probably have same ideas regarding uh, safety and security in cyberspace. 
The second component is the e-commerce. Thanks to its 904 million internet users, technologically advanced infrastructure, innovators, China has become one of the leading countries in e-commerce. And in 2020, according to the Activate Consulting Global e-commerce, it's reached 3.4 trillion and 58% of global e-commerce is concentrated in six companies, four of which are Chinese. Taobao, Tmall, Tim, GD are leading e-commerce platforms that aim to enlarge their market along with the BRI, uh, BRI member states. Um, the other component is the advanced technologies, which the advanced internet capabilities, China's DCR will export also technological achievements. Among those is the BDS3 navigation system developed by the Baidu navigation satellite system launched in 2020 to complete the previous two BDS-1 and BDS-2 systems. The new one will provide with more advanced geolog geolog uh, geolocation services that will be used for various applications and systems, including safe cities, tourism, transportation, and not limited to military purposes. While the navigation system will benefit from the space of the technology for quantum computing, that systems will secure connection even without internet and even without any navigations. That will bring, of course, the advantage in military affairs. And cyberspace, which is, uh, I think, one of the ideological component of this digital silk road, Cyberspace can be considered as one of the most controversial topics in DCR, since it is uh, the main technological aspect that is leaning on policy implementation and ideological differences. China's policy for cyberspace is based on cyber sovereignty, where major players are sovereign states and not just actors. Thus, the UN canon for sovereignty must be applicable also in cyberspace. Since this approach is controversial for Western countries, particularly for the US, as a historically leading country for technologies, as well as the supporter of free and open form of cyberspace policies, China is seen as a threat to global liberal order. Since by technological surveillance tools, limited data protection mechanism, China is seen to export not only main technologies, but also a tool set for governments to control population. Political and technical emergence of China's digital silk road and the Eurasian Economic Union is the second chapter, is the third chapter of my uh, uh, research, where I focus on the conjunction possibilities between these two agendas. Technology being technical in its nature has become a political tool as well, since the dependence of states from technology shapes the economic and economic and even military willpower. Cyberspace has become the most vivid application of those affairs. The way technology is accepted and used is of greatest importance. Thus, it, is, it dictates and district use of technology more important and the manufacture of the technology is becoming an impulse of policy implementation. Russia, as the locomotive of the Eurasian Economic Union, promotes very similar ideology in cyberspace with China, particularly in October 2020 with the initiative of Russia, a new concept of network working group on the developments in the field of information and telecommunications in the context of international security was presented to the UN General Assembly. China joined the initiative of Russia and has become the supporter of the concept since it goes in line with its national policy and international strategy for cooperation and cybersecurity, which focuses on the norm of international relations that is based on the principle of sovereignty and, and uh, enshrined in the UN, the UN charter that covers all aspects of state to state relations, including cyberspace. Uh, the confrontation on cyberspace regulations bring to the divide between the U.S. and Russia initiatives and the U.S.-China's divide on technological market, thus pushing China and Russia to work together on setting standards and regulations, as well as for easy and more comprehensive cooperation. Uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, during the All-Russian Youth Education Forum territory of Minings mentioned, we will definitely not follow the example of Americans who simply demand from everyone not to cooperate in 5G with China, in particular with Huawei. We have no such intentions. In its turn, Huawei, as a leading technology company for the 5G network, is naming Russia as a priority market and sees its vision in close cooperation. 
other members of the Eurasian Economic Union, particularly Kazakhstan, Belarus, as well as Kyrgyzstan, are also among those states that supported Russia's initiative in the EU, thus joining Russia's China Southern Roadmap. Armenia did not oppose and came up with recommendations and suggestions which were mainly technical. Moreover, in June 2018, uh, China and Kazakhstan signed a joint statement to jointly find fights against cybercrime. Uh, Kazakhstan and China have also great cooperation in e-commerce and in book, uh, I'm quite uh, in details giving a description of that. I will jump to the conclusion and uh, I will uh, mainly focus on the following that China's digital silk growth is becoming a mechanism of exporting Chinese technologies to enhance digital connectivity abroad, extend its influence and diversity, its technological dependence, and exercise its technological superpower. And I think that with China's policy on cybersecurity that is greatly posed and confronted by the US and its allies goes in line with Russia as the leading country of the EA EU. Cyberspace regulations at both countries are representing similar strategies and thinking over cyberspace regulations on international level. Based on the World Bank EAEU joint report, the EAU will gain more if the transformation is done on a union rather on a state level. Consequently, if uh, members of the EAU join uh, Russia's initiative on cyberspace regulations, which will boost their economy, but at the same time, which will give, give stress, uh, concrete strategies on cyberspace, which will go in line with China. China technological China's technological capabilities in and next generation technologies like IE are far more advanced as compared to any of the states of the Eurasian Economic Union. Therefore, there is great opportunity for them to cooperate rather than contradict. And maybe in that case, the region will gain will gain uh, technologically. But at the same time, there is a big discussion whether they have to consider also the limitations regarding the ideology and some kind of restrictions regarding liberal orders. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker is from uh, Renmin University in China, uh, Professor Zheng Yuntian, and uh, his study is about the contemporary China. Uh, please, you. Please, please, Professor Zheng, you have uh, seven minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Marvin. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, dear friends, uh, sorry for being so late because uh, I I, I'm now in Kunming, uh, which is a city in Yunnan province in China, attending a UN Biodiversity Conference. So I just uh, came back from the meeting and uh, joined us. Uh, and uh, my speech today may be a little bit uh, emotional and not so academic uh, because uh, since our book has published, I really feel that it is a really hard work and we have uh, experienced so many difficulties and challenges and we conquered them all. And I have a lot of uh, gratitude to impress today. And uh, I will share my screen because in my hotel room, uh, everything is a little bit inconvenient. So uh, I will try my best to give this uh, 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 lecture. Can you see the slides? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, my uh, topic today is the new visions on the community with a shared future for humanity. I changed the word from mankind to humanity because uh, according to the newest official document, uh, this uh, uh, the community with a shared future for humanity, not for mankind. So I use the latest one. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my respect 
and uh, gratitude to all my friends all over the world to finish this great book. I haven't received the book yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. And the left picture here is the sculpture that I photographed in Yerevan, that I've been there in 2019, just nearby my hotel. I really liked it, this picture. And I, when I did the uh, presentation in the Russian American University in Yerevan, I, I used this picture uh, before. So this picture is about hands with all my, uh, with a meaty. Uh, especially under such circumstances, this sculpture means so much more and really represent our great teamwork. And in, in our book, uh, my topic is building a community with a shared future for mankind, the new international vision of the Chinese development model. Uh, my key point is that uh, the new international vision comprises two possibilities. First is the absorbing scenario, which follows that China is the pr primary beneficiary of economic globalization and will become increasingly advanced and culturally diverse. And the other possibility is the sharing scenario. China will allow the world to share the outcome of reform and opening up through the Belt and Road Initiative. And after uh, this uh, paper, I, I keep uh, focusing on this research and uh, uh, based on President Xi Jinping's new uh, ideas, there are two new visions about this a community with a shared future for humanity. And I want to share with you today. So there are two new visions. First is building a global community uh, of health for all. This idea was brought up uh, in the year 2020. Uh, I remember it was in the March 2020 when President Xi Jinping uh, talked to uh, French President Macron. Uh, that's a, that was the first time that he uh, came up with this idea uh, because this COVID-19 really gives all the people all over the world a great challenge to face. And nothing is more important than solidarity and cooperation. So the global community of health for all will become more and more uh, crucial. And the second vision is uh, building a community of all life on earth. This one is very new. It was uh, uh, mentioned just two days ago uh, in this UN Biodiversity Conference. Uh, President Xi gave us uh, a lecture about this new idea. So I think these two new visions really uh, are really good complement to this community with a shared future for humanity. Let's see the first one. Uh, a global community of health for all. There are three backgrounds. First of all, China appreciates support from the international community uh, because uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, many countries and regions uh, support China's uh, fighting against the virus at the first time. So uh, President Xi said, uh, the Chinese people really know gratitude and really appreciate support from all over the world. So China will do its best to support uh, any, uh, many other countries to fight against the virus. Second one is China conducts active international exchanges and cooperation. And this one is more practical and realistic, especially under this background. Third one is international solidarity and cooperation in fighting the pandemic. Uh, the key word here is solidarity and cooperation, which means a lot to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, nothing is more important than solidarity. So there are so many political um, 
distortions and uh, a lot of uh, irresponsible uh, uh, discussions on the uh, social media or the websites or the media. Uh, we need to feel that uh, we are not um, survive, survival if we keep uh, have conflict among us. So we should do more cooperation with each other. That's the best weapon to fight against the virus. So this global community of health for all uh, includes four dimensions. That is my uh, understanding. First one is the substantial idea is uh, respect nature and life first. And uh, the second uh, dimension is basic principle. That is solidarity and help each other. And the third one is the uh, action safeguard. That is seek both temporary and permanent solutions. This is uh, an old Chinese word. It is called jianzhi. So seek both temporary and permanent solutions. And the fourth one is uh, the ultimate goal. The goal is cherish and defend, defend our homeland and the future. And that's my understanding to this global community of health for all. And the second one is uh, building a community of all life on earth. So it was brought up in October the 12th. Uh, President Xi called for efforts to build this community. Uh, and to enhance global biodiversity protection. And this conference uh, adopted the Kunming Declaration. It was adopted yesterday. This declaration is uh, the best achievement, uh, commits to ensuring the formulation, adoption, and implementation of an effective post-2020 global biodiversity framework to reverse the current loss of biodiversity and ensure that uh, the biodiversity is on the path to recovery by 2030 at the latest, so as to fully meet the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. So this biodiversity becomes very essential. Uh and uh, excuse me, Professor Jen, could you speed up? And uh, I think you have uh, two minutes, please. Okay. okay no problem. No, yeah, no problem, Professor Mapping. And I was about, I was just about to end my speech. So I think it, it will be more uh, emotional uh, at last. Uh, so that is the best achievements of Kuoming Declaration in this conference. And that is our harvest these days. So my last part is. Uh, uh, expectations, and there are three points. First one is, again, many thanks to all my international friends, and especially thanks to uh, Professor Gardner, Professor Minghua, and uh, my Armenian students, uh, who has, uh, uh, she has uh, graduated from Remy University, uh, Alexia Narcissia. And uh, I am planning that uh, we can organize another presentation in Remy University. Uh, that platform is National Academy of Development and Strategy, which is the top think tank in China and it belongs to Remy University of China. Uh, when the time and place is ready, I will inform all of you, my friends, to join us uh, and we can uh, share our uh, best research to many more Chinese friends. Um, and so again, at last, uh, I'm really looking forward to have more achievements in the future. So this book, definitely not, not the last one. It is the first one. It's a good and a difficult start, but it will uh, witness uh, our best cooperation in the future much more. And uh, this last picture is uh, I stand by the bank of the Lake Savon. I really miss the mania, and I hope that we can meet in China or in Armenia or in any other place all the world. And thanks to you, all my good team. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jing. And uh, uh, thank you, all the presenters. And uh, I think uh, the next uh, part will be, we will jump to the Q&A Q &A part. Professor 
uh, and, and uh, Dr. Meha, and I think I, I give back the authority to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, before we will go to collect our questions, I have uh, one question for uh, Dr. Wachtang uh, from Georgia. And uh, there's uh, Dr. Chara, among South Caucasus states, Georgia is developing very important and strategic relations with both China and the US, which is, which is the secret of Georgia. Could you be so kind to share us? Uh, and what do you think, in which way our struggle between China and US will influence uh, on Georgian affairs with these two uh, superpowers. Who will choose Georgia if there be any? Thank you, dear Professor Sakyan, for your question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, from different perspectives, uh, you can say that Georgia is the most advanced in terms of cooperation with China and the US simultaneously. That's the main idea of your question, as I understand. So. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, uh, while the strategic partner for Georgia is United States, and it's according to the uh, treaty, specific treaty, which is signed between United States and Georgia, uh, Georgia simultaneously tries to find some ways for more cooperation, more investments, more trade, more tourism, and etc. with China, which time, time, time to time makes uh, some problems for Georgia as well. Because uh, no, we remember in Georgia that uh, several times when Georgia tried, so to say, too much cooperation with China, there was some kind of uh, um, uh, noise, uh, or I would say maybe uh, some kind of uh, suggestions to limit the cooperation from different perspectives. Um, in general, it goes to the Chinese investments to Georgia. But so far, uh, Georgian government uh, tries to show that cooperation with China is not against US interest. It's uh, for the US interest in the region because the stronger the region and the stronger the Georgia will be, uh, the more reliable partner it will be. If there will be unemployment, low salaries, I don't know, uh, bad infrastructure and et cetera in Georgia, this kind of country will not be a reliable partner for the international players. So uh, the Georgian point is to show that uh, stable, um, prospering Georgia is much more reliable and uh, good friend uh, than uh, poor Georgia, so to say. So that's probably the point which uh, we are using usually when we cooperate with uh, our Western partners, not only US, but also European Union member states, uh, because some of them are also from different perspectives, uh, uh, maybe not openly aggressively against China-Georgia relations, but uh, they try to be more skeptical on this uh, relation. So um, the only way uh, from here is to show that, to prove that, uh, stability uh, in the region and in, in Georgia in this case uh, is the ground which should be built. Without this ground, it will be impossible to, um, to cooperate uh, fairly in the future. So, but if you ask me uh, in, case, in case it will happen that Georgia should choose uh, China or United States, so to say, I believe there is more chances for US uh, right now, but who knows what kind of uh, situation it will be, because uh, I don't believe that it will go so far that US or the West in general will, will push us to uh, stop all kind of cooperation with China. If uh, the West will be uh, pushing us to do that, probably uh, our position, uh, could be also uh, not so easy uh, for, for US or the West in general, uh, because uh, partnership is partnership and uh, the dominance uh, is not the kind of cooperation uh, uh, probably Georgia will allow. So to say, of course, at some level, Georgia is dependent on the West, but that does not mean uh, Georgia should do uh, what, what uh, exactly our partners are uh, saying us. Uh, I believe the good balance, and especially considering that um, 
Uh, we have free trade agreement with China, and there is uh, also one maybe uh, sooner or later will be uh, signed uh, with the U.S. as well. Uh, so uh, this kind of uh, cooperation, and this kind of platform uh, for Georgia, uh, which will have two uh, free trade agreements with uh, uh, simultaneously with China and uh, uh, U.S., will be profitable not only for Georgia, but more, uh, I believe even more, it will be profitable for China and the United States. Because if uh, there is some problems with, in direct cooperation through Georgia, we could manage uh, much closer cooperation in terms of trade, investments, and etc. So I believe uh, using Georgia as a platform uh, for a uh, peaceful platform for uh, joint interests will be much more beneficial than uh, uh, pushing Georgia to cut its contacts uh, uh, with China or whomever. So, uh, thank you, and that's my response. Thank you, dear Vahtang. And I have uh, one question for our honorable keynote speaker, Professor David Arsett. Uh, dear Professor Arsett, it is very interesting for me, and I think that for all attendees, do we have any real changes in Eurasian geopolitics if we compare pre and post COVID-19 situation? Can you switch on your microphone? Microphone. Uh, we do if we're comparing the situation in January, 2020 to the situation today many, many changes, and I, I mentioned uh, a lot of them in my remarks. Uh, but if you're asking if COVID itself caused a change in Eurasian politics, I would say that uh, what it did was it accelerated uh, many uh, pre-existing trends. Uh, it exacerbated tensions uh, between states and for, and and it, uh, also, for example, with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, because it's been driven by debt, right? It's been driven by big, expensive, capital intensive projects. And uh, by the time COVID hit, uh, many developing countries were having second thoughts about taking on additional debt. And of course, this whole this whole question of debt trap diplomacy was was becoming more and more prominent in, in the world media. Uh, and then COVID came along, and what this did is that it really uh, uh, made it much more difficult for developing countries to borrow money, and it also made it more difficult for China to lend money. Right? So, uh, if if you're talking about a direct effect of COVID. It, it certainly has made it more difficult to sustain the kind of infrastructure construction that was going on before. And I think it's, it's causing Eurasian integration to switch into other areas that are less capital intensive, more knowledge and skill intensive, like health cooperation, digital cooperation, these kinds of things. Dear Professor Arasa, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. Do we have any other questions in our audience? If you have question, please raise your hands and you can have your question. Or you can write in chat box and, and we, will, we will raise this. Uh, so uh, I will use this moment and uh, I will have another question for uh, Dr. Mabin as well. Uh, China uh, Railway Express is standing very important conduit for, for bridging Europe and, and, and Asia. And uh, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, COVID-19 is influencing on the work of China Railway uh, Express or not? What is the situation now? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, as we know, the pandemic have a big influence for all the sections of the economics and uh, of, of course it's also affected affected the the, the transportation and uh, i uh, uh, okay I, I i can make this but but uh, the influence is uh, not uh, always negative uh, if we only see the numbers of uh, only, only see one, one index 
uh, for example, for the uh, railway express, for the containers transportation between China and Europe, for this, uh, uh, for these uh, sections, for the railway transportation, the numbers uh, increased very fast. Uh, and uh, I showed you my presentation about the last year's numbers, and uh, then as uh, this year in the uh, in the from from January to August, uh, the, the numbers has uh, more than ten thousands. So, so for only if we look at only, uh, if we only look at the in this uh, uh, index, uh, uh, this in fact will be uh, will be uh, will be positive. But uh, if we look more broadly, um, it's uh, very hard to see is uh, negative or uh, it, it's very hard to see is uh, is uh, is positive. And uh, we can see there are more and more blocks uh, in this uh, transit in this transportation, not only. Uh, in the borderlines between China and uh, Russia, China and Kazakhstan, also uh, in the Europe part, also in uh, the Eurasia regions. And uh, I, I make an interview this uh, last last month about uh, the situations in Germany, and they shared me a lot of uh, information about uh, this transportation. Uh, in Germany and also the sea transportation in Germany. As, as we know, China has uh, invested in Hamburg uh, port last uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, yeah last month last month China invested in Hamburg port uh, um, and uh, this is uh, uh, I, I think that is uh, a result of the pandemic uh, effect because of the the blocks of the sea transportation in the different uh, in different routes, not only uh, not only in uh, Pacific uh, Pacific part, but also in uh, between China and Europe. And uh, okay, that's my that's my uh, some theory about this one. And uh, I also have a have a question for the uh, Dr. Wachtan about uh, about uh, your opinion. And uh, you mentioned. Uh, uh, Georgia and uh, Caucasus may be a harbor for the uh, for uh, for the cooperation uh, between China and uh, Europe, uh, between China and Eurasia. And uh, for my understanding, uh, for the as a harbor, uh, the regional harbor for this cooperation uh, between uh, uh, real uh, between real like real, I mean, among the transportation is so uh, easy to understand. Could you? mentioned, uh, could you share some other fields uh, which uh, this region, which Georgia and the other countries can uh, play this role and have this uh, uh, influence? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, dear Bima. Uh, so uh, in terms of transit, it's understandable that uh, this region is uh, not able to substitute the Russian uh, transit corridor because of many reasons uh right now but if we take uh, this region as a, a financial center uh or the uh, center for production different products uh in georgia for exporting abroad that could be uh the destiny of this region i mean yeah uh, the free trade agreement uh between china and georgia does not mean that uh georgians should produce exactly and only georgia should produce something to export to china this uh, uh, treaty allows all the rest of the world which don't have direct free trade regime uh, with china use this wonderful opportunity to trade to invest first of all to invest to georgia to produce some goods and later on to export it to china uh, with no trade barriers by the way if we take um, if we consider that uh, uh, that we have simultaneous free trade regime with China and the uh, European Union, uh, it's uh, a real story that China is uh, one of the dominant uh, on the global uh, bicycle market. But if we take the European uh, Union market, we see that uh, uh, they are not even uh, in top 10 or 10, top 20. 
because of those restrictions EU imposes on Chinese products. But if China will produce those bicycles in Georgia and export them to European Union, that uh, eases the process and allows will allow uh, China to be presented on European market with its own bicycles produced in Georgia, but uh, with Chinese investments and getting some benefits, uh, financial benefit through this project and uh, to be in top, I don't know, five or three, or maybe even top seller of the bicycles uh, uh, in the European Union. So uh, with this kind of approach, we can see that uh, uh, free trade regimes between uh, Georgia, China, EU and other countries is not an opportunity only for, for Georgia, but an opportunity for the rest of the world. Let's say India don't have a free trade regime with China. There are a lot of opportunities for Indian companies to produce goods in Georgia and export it to China through Georgia. So uh, that's what I mean, uh, where Georgia and the region can play a role of the uh, hub. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we have another uh, question from Professor uh, Hussein Maklad from Syria. He is the head of international department. Uh, in the, he is the head of the Department of International Relations at Damascus University. We are very happy that you are here with us. Please, you can raise your ask, question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, presentations and uh, congratulations uh, for uh, your uh, new book and. Uh, uh, for the information about uh, the uh, Russian and uh, Chinese uh, relation and uh, uh, connections with uh, your uh, countries. Uh, my question is, uh, for me, the most important thing in uh, the uh, Chinese-Russian uh, uh, relations uh, are uh, the most important variable is uh, America, uh, the United States of America. Uh, I think uh, we can talk about uh, a good relation between Russia and uh, China without uh, the influence of uh, United States of America, uh, the, the unipolar now in the world. Um, uh, here, if we talk about, uh, uh, th this is in the one part, and the second part, uh, the uh, international uh, system in uh, general and the influence of international system uh, on uh, this uh, relation between China and uh, Russia and uh, other countries, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia uh, in general. Um, my question, uh, uh, how uh, to uh, face uh, this uh, challenge from the United States of America uh, in controlling uh, the uh, uh, closer relationship between China and Russia and other regional uh, player uh, as uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, another time, thank you for your uh, information and presentation and uh, book. Thank you uh, very much, Professor. Mm -hmm. Same for your uh, for your very interesting comment. The first one was comment, and the second one is a question. Um, I think that for uh, your Russian continent will be much more better if China, Russia, and the US find some way for cooperation. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they are main powers plus uh, plus uh, European Union, Japan. And if they can, if they can find some platform for cooperation, it will be better for for the Russian continent and for medium and small countries such as Syria, Armenia, and and other. And here is I can speak also about Russian new in, initiative, uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership, which is going to make some kind of integration uh, for all all uh, strategies. Uh, Let's say uh, and 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 make some platform for discussions and and for cooperations. Actually, I think that uh, cooperation is much more better in our continent than contradiction. And I hope that uh, uh, if we have good example, this book is good is example. We had uh, we have authors from many many countries, and we could write this book. Uh, 
due to our discussions, negotiations, and hopefully this book will stand another good um, source for recommendations for governments, which they will use for further cooperation, but not for contradiction. Thank you. Do we have any other comments, uh, questions, please? If no, I want to thank you all speakers. Thank you very much that you have found time and you uh, shared with us your very important thoughts. And thank you, thanks go to our audience, our friends, uh, colleagues from different, uh, different countries who joined us during this, this uh, conference. I hope that we will keep cooperation and, and we will write new books and we will have new conferences. Thank you. Thank you.